thanks uh, to all of the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, present some work in here. So uh, this is work which is uh, partly in preparation and uh, some of it is actually contained in this uh, previous paper done in collaboration with uh, Giulio Biroli and Chiara Camarotta. And uh, what we do is to look at uh, what I will define in a minute to be the geometrical properties of uh, the energy landscape of uh, the pure P-spin. And uh, in particular, we are focusing on uh, the statistics of saddles in this energy landscape and on the information that one can extract from these statistics about the dynamical exploration of these landscapes by means of the system. So this is the outline. I will, uh, first of all, uh, state what are the questions that we want to address here, and I will uh, clarify what I mean by geometrical properties. And then I will uh, discuss some known features of this spherical P-spin, which uh, are actually now proven. So this part uh, has a huge overlap with a nice talk by uh, Aufinger, Antonio Aufinger this morning. I will then say something about the method which we use. And uh, here, uh, this is just to stress uh, what are the new ingredients with respect to uh, approaches that have been developed before uh, to tackle very similar questions. And finally, I will give uh, the results for the PSP. OK, so let me start with a question. And uh, somehow, the uh, general framework is as follows. We have a landscape, which in my case will be uh, an energy landscape. But it could be some generic functional, uh, depending on very many variables, which are encoded in this vector S here, that uh, lives on a configuration space that is very large dimension. So the dimension here is uh, capital N, and uh, this is the large parameter in, uh, in this problem. And uh, this landscape can be uh, very complicated in the sense of being uh, very non-convex with this exponentially huge number of uh, stationary points. Uh, with a coefficient here that is the complexity that, uh, as we saw for the, uh, let's say, simplest uh, examples of landscapes which are uh, random functionals with Gaussian statistics, can actually be uh, computed explicitly. And this was done uh, back in the 90s by uh, many of the people uh, who are here using uh, replicas or clones or uh, replica potentials. And as we saw recently, uh, some of these results have even been put on rigorous grounds by mathematicians with this uh, cut slice formalism. So what this uh, calculation allowed to get is, in general, the uh, typical number of uh, critical or stationary points uh, as a function of their stability, so whether they are minima or saddles, and as a function of their energy or depth in this uh, landscape, which is already an important information if one wants to characterize the dynamics, of course, uh, whenever the dynamics can really be interpreted as a motion along the surface of this uh, landscape, which attempts to reach uh, the optimal state that is uh, the global minimum, so the ground state uh, in this case. But however, there are other questions which uh, one may ask that are uh, possibly uh, less investigated in this literature. And uh, these questions are related to how these critical points are distributed not only in terms of their energy or that, but also in terms of their position in the underlying configuration space. So one might ask, if I have two local minima at different energies, what are the typical distances between them? Do they concentrate in a given region of configuration space, or are they somehow uh, randomly distributed? And also, how are they connected? So for instance, here I have minima which are nearby. What are the saddles that allow to go from one to another through some uh, connected path uh, in, the, in the landscape? And what is the height of these saddles, which of course uh, gives a measure of the barrier that the system has to cross uh, to go from one point to another. So these are uh, the properties that I uh, call uh, geometrical properties, because you have this idea of distances and position uh, in configuration space. And, uh, and I will say that th these are really crucial to understand quantitatively the dynamics in uh, non-convex landscapes, in particular in the regime of uh, activated dynamics, which was uh, discussed in the uh, previous talk by uh, Veronique Gerard, uh, that here is relevant uh, when the dimension of configuration space n is maybe very large, but it is not strictly infinite. So you don't have uh, barriers which diverge uh, to infinity. Now, in this case, activated processes can occur in which the system, which is trapped in a local minimum for a very large time, eventually escapes through the crossing of energy barriers. And to model these processes, you need to know essentially two things. So the first one is how high you need to climb up. So what is the barrier, which is uh, what sets the time scale for this type of processes. And the second question is, once you are up here, what is the portion of configuration space which is accessible to you afterwards? So if you want, what is the connectivity of uh, your first minimum? 
And obviously, if you are in high dimension, there can be a proliferation in, in the number of uh, possible paths that the system can follow, and then one has to think about uh, distribution of, uh, of these quantities. And then if these distributions are known, one can uh, derive or, or uh, think about effective models for these dynamics. And what is perhaps uh, the best known is a uh, bouchot trap model, where essentially one uh, simplifies configuration space to some collection of traps, which represent uh, local minima with randomly distributed depth. And uh, the dynamics is just a random walk between these traps with transition rates that depend only on the energy of the departing trap and not on the one of the arrival trap. So, so the picture that is behind this is that the system is confined in a local minimum and then to escape, it has to climb up to some fixed value of uh, the, the landscape that I call here the threshold, irrespectively of the depth uh, of the minimum. And then once you are, are up here, all configuration space is accessible to you. So the space of traps is, uh, is fully connected. And this is a nice model because one can compute quantities. And uh, as we saw this morning, uh, this is a paradigm in the sense that it has been shown to capture the long time dynamics of other models, such as uh, the random energy model uh, of Derrida, which are uh, which I would call the simplest model in the sense that here one has no correlation uh, between the energy evaluated at different points in configuration space. So of course this is uh, nice and it raises uh, a natural question that is how general is this? So can we uh, generalize this to models which are slightly more complicated in the sense that uh, the network of minima or traps in configuration space is more uh, structured, you have correlations in the energy density, uh, but still the model is simple enough so that you can uh, do calculations and compute uh, these distributions uh, explicitly. And this very naturally leads to uh, the model that we look at, that is this uh, spherical p spin. Now, the, the landscape of the p spin was already discussed, so I will just recall that in this case uh, the energy is just a random monomial, uh, like here. It has correlation between different points in configuration space, which for me uh, is just a sphere in dimension n. But this correlation has this nice property of being isotropic. So there is uh, rotation invariance, meaning that uh, this function depends only on the overlap on the distance between uh, these points on the sphere. And uh, this is a rugged landscape with an exponential number of uh, stationary points at each value of uh, the energy density. And there is this threshold value at which you have a transition related to the stability of these stationary points, uh, which, which is encoded in the Hessian matrices of, uh, of the landscape evaluated at this uh, zero gradient point. So what you find is that typically local minima are confined below this threshold value, and their Hessian has an eigenvalue density that looks like this. So it, uh, it is a GOE matrix. Uh, statistically, and uh, the spectrum is a semicircle which is gapped away from zero. And then if you increase in energy, you find uh, that the gap closes, and exactly at the threshold you have uh, marginality and the appearance of a uh, flat direction. And then if you go above the threshold, you find many negative eigenvalues, which indicate that stationary points up here have many directions in configuration space where the landscape is downhill. So they are saddles uh, with a huge index. So minima are typically below the threshold. And uh, as we saw, typically here means that um, it, it means that they are the uh, exponentially, so they are dominant at the exponential scale in n. So if I take a stationary point at random, uh, in this energy regime, I will find with high probability that this is a minimum. But if n is finite, we know that uh, there is actually some finite probability to find something else. And, uh, and indeed, what we can do is to compute a stationary point, conditioning explicitly that they are not minima, but that they are saddled with index 1, 2, 3. So they have a nation that looks like this, with a bulk that is uh, like for minima. And then you have a bunch of eigenvalues, so in this case, uh, only one, which is isolated uh, from the bulk and uh, which is negative. And you find the curves that, uh, that now are uh, proven rigorously to be, uh, to be like this, uh, where you see that the number so of this uh, saddle of finite index is exponentially smaller with respect to the one of minima, which is the top curve. And this is due to the fact that finding a nation like this comes with a cost in terms of probability that is a large deviation that is exponential in n. And so this is what gives uh, the suppression here. But nevertheless, you still have exponentially many saddles because these complexities are, uh, are positive. So there is a sharp organization in, uh, in of these points in terms of energies. 
everything is controlled by this threshold, and this uh, shows up uh, in the dynamics as well if you try to optimize uh, this functional, and it shows up as a separation of time scales. So you basically find that uh, over short time scales, which do not scale extensively with your dimension n, you, um, you descend in this landscape uh, dominated by the saddles, but you only reach asymptotically this uh, threshold value of the energy. And to go below the threshold, you really need to wait uh, times, which are much, much larger, so exponentially large uh, in n. And this is the regime in which uh, one expects these activated processes to occur, where the system explores uh, the bottom of the landscape. And uh, to understand this, as, as I said, one really needs uh, to understand better geometry. So in particular, we know uh, that we have many saddles in there, but we don't know where they are. So we know that typically they will be very far away from each other and they will be disconnected. And an important question is, if I find a minimum, which among these saddles are actually nearby in configuration space and are connected to this minimum? by which I mean that the negative direction of the saddle goes down uh, to the minimum. And can these saddles be used to perform activated jumps while staying below this uh, threshold value uh, of the energy? And this would correspond to a picture for the dynamics, which is a bit richer than what is encoded in these uh, trap processes that always assume that you have to climb up to this fixed value that now one can identify with the threshold for the p-spin where uh, the landscape is, is marginal and uh, possibly connected. OK, so these are uh, the questions. And now, in order to get some hints uh, into these uh, questions, what we do is uh, essentially to redo uh, the landscape analysis for this p-spin, but uh, conditioning on the geometry. So this means that uh, we take some local minimum of our energy functional, which uh, I will call S0, that corresponds uh, to the North Pole in this uh, picture. And then we look at properties of the landscape as a function of the distance to this uh, local minimum, or if you want, as a function of the overlap uh, to this minimum. So the first thing that one can ask is, what are the typical, and typical always means exponentially most numerous in N, capital N, uh, stationary points that you find as a function uh, of this distance? which is a question that allows to understand, for instance, uh, the minimal distance that you need to reach in order to find other stationary points uh, uh, different from this local minimum. Uh, what are these closest stationary points? So are they minima, are they saddles? And in general, uh, does it change as we increase uh, the distance from this minimum here? And no, 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 it's chosen uh, below the threshold, yes. So once we have this information on typical points, what we do is then to specifically look for saddles and uh, to compute all of the saddles which are connected geometrically to this uh, minimum S0, where uh, the emphasis here is in this all, which means that um, one not always wants to find the saddles where they are at the dominant stationary points, but also in the, reg in the regions of configuration space where saddles are exponentially subdominant with respect to minima. So you have to do some large deviation uh, calculation imposing that the Hessian is the one of a saddle and keeping into account this uh, constraint on the overlap. And then for some of these saddles, we also check that they are dynamically connected to the minimum, meaning that if we do the dynamics with the saddle as, a, as an initial condition, we find that there is a solution that goes down to the minimum. So there is a dynamical path which connects uh, these two stationary points. So this gives information on the statistics of uh, the energy barriers. And then uh, what we can also do is to look at connectivity of this minimum by looking at which other local minima are connected uh, to the first one through the saddles which, uh, which we have. Okay, so, so the method which we use to, uh, to perform this calculation is, uh, is based on, the, on this uh, cut trace formalism. Wait, 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 Yes. Yeah, uh, so, so the idea is that if you do that calculation without asking what is the overlap, what you are counting are saddles which will be orthogonal to uh, any minimum that you pick up. And this is because the sphere is very high dimensional. So you, you select a minimum and all configuration space will be orthogonal to it. So that exponentially large number of saddles is orthogonal to the minimum. And then you have to do some large deviation in this overlap and ask, is there a subleading number of saddles which are actually at finite overlap uh, 
with a minimum I'm looking at. But just, I guess, just the basic calculus, there are exponentially more minima than there are satellites. Yes. In here. So most of the minima don't have any satellites, which is near them below pressure. But I think that is not the same energy. At the given energy, there are exponentially more minima, but if you look at the energy, oh, sorry, sorry. You, you mean that the energy of minima and sados, no, it's not the same. Actually, the sados that you find close to a minimum are at way higher energy than, uh, than the minimum, the one in the minimum. Okay, so, so the method, um, I think the starting point is, is uh, this very basic uh, formula for the number of stationary points, and this is for fixed realization of this uh, energy landscape. And it tells you that this number is just an integral over all of those points on the sphere, which are at overlap Q from this special point, which you want to be uh, a local minimum, of several constraints, so one which fix that uh, as is stationary, one which fix the energy density. Then you can fix the stability. So for instance, if you want a saddle, you want that at least one eigenvalue of the Hessian uh, is negative. And then you have this factor, which comes out uh, as a Jacobian of this constraint, basically. Uh, and it's there because this uh, gradient is in general nonlinear. So given this, uh, one can proceed in different ways. One, uh, one possible way is to exponentiate all of these constraints, uh, including the determinant here. So you drop the absolute value. You use, for instance, uh, Grassmann variables. And then you do a saddle point to extract uh, the leading order term in N. And uh, an alternative way is to rewrite, for instance, the average of this quantity uh, using this Cathrace formula that simply tells you that uh, this is again the integral over the sphere of two terms. So this term here is uh, the, pro the joint probability distribution of the field and its gradient at the point S, conditioned to the fact that S is closed uh, to another zero gradient point, which is S0, and the conditioning is, uh, I just put it as this superscript. And then you have the expectation value of the action, again conditioned to the fact that the point itself is stationary and that it is at fixed overlap from, uh, from another stationary point. So, so far, this is just a rewriting of the average of this, uh, of this object. Uh, but then the input, which I think uh, comes from this uh, mathematical literature and uh, possibly starting from uh, works of Ian Fyodorov, is in realizing that if you have isotropic Gaussian functionals, you can compute these uh, conditional distributions explicitly. So you know uh, what is the joint distribution of the energies at nearby stationary points, and you know what is the full statistics of the Hessian at one stationary point, again, conditioned to be close to another one. And this second element is uh, what is important in here, because if you have the statistics of this Hessian, then you can, uh, you can go well beyond the getting, let's say, the, the leading order term of uh, exponentially of this object here. That is what you would get, for instance, uh, in a saddle point. But you can look at the density of state and subleading corrections to the density of states, which are order 1 over n. And these are the isolated eigenvalue that allow you to discriminate between uh, minima and saddles. It allows you to do large deviations and so to condition to find uh, saddles. It allows you to start the dynamics from uh, some of the saddles. And so, and so it's really the ingredient that helps if one uh, wants to do the things uh, that I mentioned before. So just as an example, of course, conditioning modifies your statistics. So for instance, in the case of the Ashen, if we didn't condition, uh, the statistics, as I said, is the one of a GOE, which is uh, as a shift that depends on the energy of, uh, of the minimum. But now if you force this point to be close to some other stationary point, its Hessian will have a modified statistics with some entries that have different variances and, and, um, and averages that depend explicitly on uh, the parameters, which are energy densities of this minima and, uh, and their overlap which is very natural because you are basically breaking the isotropy of your system by forcing to be uh, close to one uh, fixed direction. And this finite rank perturbation which emerge due to this conditioning are precisely what uh, tend to generate this isolated eigenvalue. So you find that the more you go closer to a minimum, your stationary point is more prone to develop some instability, so some negative direction that will be towards uh, the minimum itself. And, uh, and this isolated eigenvalue, I think, uh, that will be uh, the next talk, uh, which um, will show a very nice example of uh, the appearance of this type of instabilities uh, in another model. OK, so the last comment on the method is that I showed formulas for the average 
number of stationary points whose log gives uh, the annealed complexity. But of course, what we want is, uh, is a quenched complexity, but uh, this we know how to uh, compute. Uh, that is by means uh, of replicas. So what we actually do is to compute higher moments of this number of stationary points, which uh, involves that you have to control uh, the statistics of uh, the system at all of these points, Hessians, gradients, and, uh, and energy field, and then you use replica trick to get uh, the quench complexity. And the generalization of this cuts rise to, uh, to the quench calculation is, uh, uh, is uh, given in here. OK. So now let me show uh, what we get for uh, the case of the spherical P-spin. So again, uh, this is the setting. S0 is our uh, fixed minimum, and then we move uh, we, we decrease the overlap, so we increase the distance from uh, S0. So in, uh, Q equal to 1 means sitting at S0, and then uh, the distance increases in this direction. And we look at which stationary points we find. And here I'm plotting the energy density of uh, these points. And uh, the different curves correspond to different uh, complexities of these points. So for instance, the bottom curve in here is for zero complexity, and it gives you the energy of the deepest stationary point that you find uh, at the given overlap. And the color code corresponds uh, to the stability. So now, uh, the first thing that you notice is that if you are sitting in a minimum, you have indeed to go to some extensive distance or, or overlap in order to find uh, other stationary points. And these stationary points at the beginning are at very high energy, at the threshold energy, which is uh, where this plot is cutted. Uh, in this case, is uh, minus 1.165. It's, uh, in this case, it's fixed now. It's, uh, yes, it's here. Then I will show the dependence on, S, uh, S, uh, on E0. So the closest are uh, the threshold states. And then if you increase uh, the distance, you start finding states uh, at lower energy. And uh, at the beginning, as I said, they are saddles, so they have this single eigenvalue that points uh, towards your minimum. And then exactly at the minima, local minima of this uh, isocomplexity curves, you find a transition from saddles to minima. So here, the, uh, the isolated eigenvalue is zero. And uh, then the first minima, the darker one uh, that you find, are actually still connected to your S0 because they still have this isolated eigenvalue, so they still feel uh, the presence of uh, S0, and then eventually you cross over to some uh, family of minima, which is uncorrelated to S0, because the eigenvalue gets absorbed uh, into the bulk. So what this shows is that, indeed, you have a full family of saddles around you with an extensive range uh, in energy. And among them, you can identify the optimal saddle, which is the one with the lowest uh, possible energy, that is uh, the one at this local minimum which is optimal in terms of energy, but not in terms of complexity. So if I now zoom on the violet part, which corresponds uh, to saddles, and I redo overlap versus energy, and now the colors are the complexity, what you see is that the optimal saddle is down here, and it has uh, zero complexity. But then you will have, at higher energy, an exponentially larger number of saddles. So if you ask which ones will be selected by the system to escape, it is likely that there, there are parameters of the dynamics that, uh, that fix it. So for instance, temperature uh, should play a role here. So as I said, this is for fixed energy of the local minimum. Then you can look at how this distribution of saddle changes if you change uh, the energy of the minimum. And here I'm plotting just the, uh, the dependence of the energy of this optimal saddle from uh, the energy of the minimum, just to show that there is indeed some uh, non-trivial correlation. So this is, uh, this is, not, uh, this is a nonlinear dependence in here. And if you then look at the distance of this optimal saddle, which you can argue uh, gives a measure of, of the basing of attraction of your uh, local minimum, you find that there is also a dependence on the energy there. In particular, uh, the deeper is your minimum, the larger is, uh, is, the basing, uh, is its basing of attraction. OK, so this is uh, for, uh, let's say, this family of closest saddles. And now that you have identified them, the next question that you can ask is, if the system manages to, to reach them, where does it end up afterwards? And, uh, and as I mentioned, this is a question that you can address dynamically. So you do uh, essentially gradient descent uh, dynamics starting from uh, these saddles. And you find uh, 
uh, as I said, that there is a solution that goes back to your first, first minimum. And then there is another asymptotic solution, which goes back uh, to another local minimum, S infinity. And, uh, and what you want to do is to study the properties of this local minimum as a function of the parameter of uh, the saddle uh, that you chose. So by properties, I mean, so this is again the same plot. So you start from a minimum, you have the saddle here with its own energy, and you end up to a minimum S infinity, which will have its own energy density, infinity, and will be at overlap Q infinity from the, uh, the first minimum. And this parameter depends on the distance of the saddle and on the height uh, of the saddle. And uh, you can study this. So this is a plot which uh, I'm, I'm sure it's a bit hard to grasp in a few seconds, but I'll try to uh, say the main things. So basically, this is giving uh, overlap between the two minima and the energy of of the minimum that you reach as a function of the distance of the saddle from the first minimum and of the energy of the saddle, which corresponds uh, to the different curves. And uh, somehow the idea is that, uh, let's say that you have this uh, set of saddles and you fix the energy of the saddle and you change the overlap with the first minimum. So what you can find is that uh, the saddles which are closer uh, to the minimum are in some sense better, uh, meaning that they allow you to reach uh, minima which are deeper in, uh, in energy and which are more far away in configuration space. So you explore uh, more configuration space. But uh, nevertheless, if you move in energy along this uh, curve that corresponds to the closest saddles, you find uh, that there is some uh, non-trivial uh, dependence. So for instance, the optimal saddle here is also optimal in the sense that you reach from it the deepest minima, but it is not optimal in terms of overlap because you don't go uh, as far as you uh, could go using other saddles. So there are these uh, correlations which, uh, which appear. But somehow, in general, if you look at this plot and, and you look at the numbers, you might be uh, a bit disappointed because you realize that the range of energies of uh, the minima that you reach is actually very uh, tiny and it's very high. So these minima are close to the threshold. And also in overlap, you are always around 0.6. So what this is telling you is that the saddles which we found, yes, maybe are, are the closest ones, so are the ones that the system uses to escape uh, first. But then once it does it, it stays very high in energy and it doesn't move uh, much far away. So it's possible that uh, and likely that during these dynamics, there will be many returns back to the, uh, to the first minimum. And most importantly, these are not the saddles which correspond to the so-called dynamical barriers, that is, uh, the barrier that you have to cross to reach other local minima that are uncorrelated to your initial conditions, so for instance, which are at zero overlap from, uh, from your initial condition. The minima which we find are very correlated with, uh, with the first one. Okay. So you have this, but then you uh, remember that we are computing only the typical stationary points. And we found that they are subtle if you are sufficiently close, but then there is a full region where uh, typical stationary points are actually minima. But you can ask, are there saddles also in this region that I didn't see because they are subleading in number uh, with respect to local minima? So to, to answer to this, what you have to do is uh, a large deviation calculation. So you have to ask explicitly that the points that you find are at fixed overlap from the first minimum, have at least one eigenvalue that is, um, that is negative. So I set it to zero because they are the marginal saddles will be the most numerous. And they have to be connected to your minimum. So you want that the eigenvector associated to this eigenvalue has a huge overlap with, uh, with a direction in configuration space which connects this uh, minimum and saddles. So you can do this uh, complexity calculation. And then uh, what I'm showing here is uh, essentially the first plot. So it's again overlap versus energy density. Uh, so below it, uh, before it was unconstrained and it corresponded to the bottom curve. So this is the zero complexity curve. And uh, so you see that at the beginning they were saddles and then you found the minima. And where you have minima, you can now constrain to find the saddles and plot the energy of the deepest saddles that you find at, uh, at the given overlap. And this is this uh, continuation of the uh, violet curve. And uh, you see that there is a continuous branch, and this corresponds to uh, saddles which are connected to your minimum uh, in configuration space. And then there is a discontinuous, which corresponds instead to uh, saddles which are uh, disconnected. And the transition occurs at the local maximum of, uh, of this uh, potential curve, uh, if you want. 
Uh, and so you can ask whether these saddles in here, in particular the one at the maximum, actually correspond to this uh, dynamical barrier. So if you reach them, you can go to minima, which are uh, at zero overlap. And this would correspond to a barrier which is lower than the threshold that is this uh, dashed line. And uh, to answer to this question, what you have to do is to combine dynamics and, uh, and large deviations. And this is something which is uh, in progress. Uh, so possibly soon uh, there will be also an answer to this. OK, so that's basically it. Uh, the summary is that we are looking at uh, geometrical properties of, uh, of the PSP in energy landscape. And the uh, perspectives are all in the direction of uh, trying to use this information to understand something about this. Uh, regime of uh, activated dynamics. Okay, thank you. You mean with the three replica potential? Yes, so there is, uh, there were two regimes. One regime in which the barrier that you found in that way was essentially the barrier given by the two replica potential, the local maximum. And what we find is that the, the local maximum of the two replica potential coincides with the local maximum of the green curve, which is a lower bound of the dynamical barrier. And uh, the ones we have is, uh, is slightly above. So that's why I say it's compatible with, uh, with the lower bounds. Uh, but then you have another regime in which uh, it was not uh, given yes. by the local maximum, and that I didn't compare. I didn't compare. it <laughs> in any legal way and look at it. Thanks. Yeah, Luca? Yeah. In the cat size formula you have the determinant of the Asia. Okay. So I was wondering how do you take care of the fact that when you have marginal saddles uh, you have uh, the zero eye value? Yes. So there you can uh, okay here the the point is that everything is is uh, essentially a deformation of a GUE matrix. So you, you really ask what is the distribution of entries of my Hessian? And you find that uh, this uh, looks like this. So you have a huge block, which is GOE-like. And then you have uh, a special direction that is this direction that connects the two minima, where you have not a rotation invariance and you have a different statistics. But once you have this, you, you can compute the typical value and the fluctuations of the smallest eigenvalue that will be, uh, in general, isolated from, uh, from the bike. So you do like uh, the well, Including zero, yes, yes, you can follow for arbitrary values. You can no other questions? Okay, so we thank again.